you can relax. Colleen and Eric have a podcast. The world is scary and we're locked in our home. But now we have big microphones. So you can relax. That's the name of our podcast. Hello. Welcome to Relax the Podcast. I'm Colleen Ballinger. And normally I am sitting next to my wonderful husband, Eric Stockland. But this week he is not here. He left me. I'm all alone. So you guys are stuck listening to my obnoxious voice for an hour and a half and not Eric's beautiful voice. Um, It's going to be a weird one, but Eric has work today, so he's not able to do this. He's also been super dad through my pregnancy. Um, He has taken over a lot of the responsibilities because I'm completely useless. And uh, so He's been very overwhelmed and has gotten behind on work and responsibilities. And this is the only time we had available to do the podcast this week. And now he's not available and I miss him. But I was like, you know what? I knew by myself. And he was like, how are you going to talk by yourself to a camera for an hour to an hour and a half? And I was like, it's what I've been doing for over a decade. I think I'm up for the challenge. You know, so this is a little different, obviously, than like my normal (laughs) videos where it is just me talking to my vlog camera every day. Um, It is a podcast. So I'm even curious if I'm going to be able to pull this off. So this is going to be very interesting. You're going to be listening to a emotional, dramatic, hot mess, pregnant woman. Um, Just talk. I'm just going to talk to myself for an hour to an hour and a half. And that could be disastrous and it could be entertaining. It could be both. Um, I wonder how many people have clicked off this episode already. (laughs) But hello, I'm excited to try it out. And also, I told Eric that um, this is going to have to, we're going to have to switch roles because there's going to become a time where I am so freaking pregnant and so miserable that he's going to have to do these episodes alone. Um, I'm sure like, you know, and he said, absolutely not. And I was like, no, it's coming. And I feel like you guys would love that episode. So I almost like wanted to do this one alone, just like I could have gotten a co-host for it. Like I could have asked someone to do it with me, but, um, I was like, if I do it alone, then that forces Eric to have to do an episode alone later down the line, which I personally would love to listen to, and I'm sure you guys would too. So let's get into the episode. Relax the podcast, Colleen Ballinger all by herself. Her husband is nowhere to be seen. Um, So first off, how we start these episodes is we say, who needs to relax this week? And who I think needs to relax this week is air conditioning companies. And I do wish Eric were here right now because I feel like he would agree with me. Um, I feel like this would have been his relax this week. So we have uh, a large house with a wonderful air conditioning system that sometimes breaks when it gets too hot in Los Angeles. And right now it's been up in the 90s and the hundreds. It's been very hot. And so he thought, I have a pregnant wife. We have this nice house, but I don't want, I want to get ahead of this problem. Because if I wait until the air conditioner breaks, to call an air conditioning company just to do a checkup. We haven't had it looked at in a year. Then when it gets super, super hot and it breaks and everyone's power in Los Angeles is a mess and everyone's air conditioning is breaking, ours has already been looked at and already been fixed. So he was like actually being Superman and calling ahead. So he called and made an appointment just to get a checkup, a tune-up of our air conditioning system. And a day before these guys come, our air conditioning breaks. (laughs) which is, it just seems a little fishy. I feel like maybe they had like some button that they could push. They're like, oh, they made an appointment for just a regular checkup. There's nothing wrong with their air conditioning. Let's make something wrong with their air conditioning. Also, this is what I think. I, I think the same thing happens when the new iPhone comes out. I feel like there's a button that Apple pushes to break everyone's phones that is not the brand new iPhone. Like I feel like everyone's phones break when the new iPhone comes out. And I think this is happening with air conditioning companies. So they come to our house. This has been a huge disaster this week. And part of the reason Eric has gotten behind on work and responsibilities and things that he has to do because he has been dealing with air conditioning companies all week. And (laughs) it's been a full-time job. It's been infuriating. So I'm going to try to tell this story as quickly as possible 
this is probably not entertaining. <laughs> like, I feel like most people on a podcast would talk about like drama or tea or like something interesting, some crazy stories. And I'm going to talk about our air conditioning. <laughs> um, but so what happened was the air conditioning broke on our bottom floor. So we have a different air conditioning unit for upstairs than downstairs. So our upstairs one is working. Our downstairs one is not. And so they show up and they're like, yeah, the unit is broken and your electric box. I don't know what these things are called, guys. I'm not a scientist, but whatever the, what are they called? The box with all the switches in it. Oh, come on. I'm such an idiot. This is why I need a co-host. I need someone to make fun of me when I don't know things. The, the electric box thingy. Um, anyway, uh, they were like, let's check that. So they went and checked it and it looked as though the, the air conditioner that does the whole bottom floor had made this electricity box switch. Um, the fuse went out or something. I don't know. And so the air conditioning guy says, Hey, you need to call an electrician to come and deal with this issue. And then we'll come back. And Eric said, okay. So we call an electrician and an electrician comes and he's like, all right, I can fix this, but it's going to be $600. And Eric's like, what the heck? I just like, I just wanted my air conditioning to be looked at. And now I'm paying $600 to this electrician. So then he, he, he's like, you need this part and blah, blah. So he fixed the thing. It was broken. And so he fixed the thing and we had to pay all this money. And then the air conditioner guy comes back the next day and he's like, oh, the air conditioner is still not working. It didn't fix it. And that had nothing to do with it. So we paid this freaking electrician $600 to fix something. I mean, it needed to be fixed anyway. Like we would have had to fix it anyway, but it was just like annoying. So then the air conditioning guy's like, okay, yeah, let me look at it. So they're here all day and they go, oh, you know what? We can fix this, but we need to weld a piece onto your air conditioner machine. So we need a welder. So we'll come back in a few days with a welder. So they come back a few days later with a welder. So now this is the third visit from them and a visit from the electrician. And the welder comes and he's here the whole day, like eight hours. And it's, and Eric has to be there the whole time to answer questions, help him go up and down the ladder. Like, so Eric's just with these guys all day. It's like a full-time job. Eric is now an electrician and an air conditioning company, man. And this guy says he fixes the air conditioner. And so he comes downstairs. He's like, is it working? Is it on? And it was on, it worked. And we're like, this is great. So then this guy leaves. And like a couple hours later, Eric's like, Hey, air conditioner's not working again. <laughs> and so, and we spent, I'm not even going to tell you how much money we spent because it, it would make you gag. It was a lot of money we spent on welding some part onto our air conditioning box. And, um, so we spent, I mean, I'm talking thousands, like it was insane. And so then the guy leaves and then at, right after he leaves, sure enough, the air conditioner breaks again. And so the next day, Eric calls their conditioning company again. And not to mention, they like sold us on this like package. They're like, oh, well, if you pay this yearly fee, you'll be on this list of VIP customers. And you, we will always be here within 24 hours. Every time you call us, whatever, whenever you have a problem. So if all of Los Angeles' air conditioning goes out, we're going to come to you first because you're a VIP member. And he was like, my wife's pregnant with twins. I don't want her in the middle of summer to be waiting a week for the air conditioning guys to come. Like if the air goes out, like, yeah, we're going to do this stupid package. And I agreed. I thought it was a great idea. So he calls them the next day and he's like, Hey, you guys have been here three times and we've paid thousands of dollars. And now the air conditioner is not working again. And they were like, okay, we can have someone come next week. And he was like, wait a minute, I'm paying for you to come in within 24 hours. And they're like, uh, okay, we can have someone come Saturday, which is like three days later. And Eric's like, okay, fine. Saturday. And she's like, actually we can't come Saturday. <laughs> it was so annoying. And then Eric's like, well, can you just get here? Like you, we paid all this money. Like, can you just freaking come? And so they're like this, I think this is like a Wednesday or something. They're like, we can come Friday. And so it's not 24 hours, which I was pretty mad about because we're paid for this 24 hour service and they're not coming within 24 hours. Oh my God. Is anyone listening to this podcast? I'm just ranting about our air conditioning problems. <laughs> so then the guy comes back and he shows up and he's like in a bad mood and he's, he's not having it. And he's like, 
all right, what's the problem? We're like, well, we paid you guys all this money and now it's not working again. And he's like, well, I'm going to have to go on the roof to, to check this out. And we're like, right. Cause that's where air conditioner is or air conditioning units. And Eric was like, right. He's like, well, I didn't bring a tall enough ladder. And Eric was like, okay. He's like, so, hmm, can't really do anything for you. So I'll come back next week. <laughs> So Eric and I are just like ripping out our hair. We're like, why is this so complicated? Like I, this, these air conditioning people have been to our house four times. We've spent thousands of dollars and the air conditioner <laughs> that wasn't broken. Like we just wanted, <laughs> we just wanted it to be looked at. Like we just wanted them to come and be like, oh, it's got enough coolant in it. There's no issues. Like, or there is an issue. You should fix this now before the dead of summer comes. And like, it's everyone's air conditioner is breaking. And instead we have now a broken air conditioner. We are thousands of dollars less in our bank accounts. And we paid an electrician $600 and it's still broken. And now they're not coming till next week. And it has just been like, all I can do is laugh because it's like, it's absurd. So I don't know if this is like, I mean, I know this is petty and stupid. And there's obviously way bigger, more important issues in the world than this. Like it is not a big deal at all. Um, but it has been very frustrating. And so I'm hoping someone out there can relate to this like experience of like, I just feel like there are certain types of people who just like are out to scam you. Like, it's like, you know, you go to a, like no one likes going to a car dealership or like getting your car fixed. Like you go get your oil changed. Like, well, actually you need a new air conditioning system in your car. And actually you need uh, a whole new engine and they like find problems. Like that's kind of how it feels. It just feels like there, there are some companies and some types of people that take advantage of the fact that they know more about the product than you do. If that makes sense. Like sometimes it feels like these air can, and maybe this isn't true. I hope it's not true, but like, it kind of feels like these air conditioning people are like, well, we're on the roof. They can't get up on the roof. So we could say any problem we want and charge them whatever we want. And they just have to believe us because they don't know anything about air conditioning units. So it's been very frustrating. Um, and I'm pretty sure if Eric were sitting next to me, this would be the exact thing he would be ranting about. And honestly, I feel like it would fill an entire episode. Like Eric could probably talk about this for hours. Like, I mean, he has like, this has been the, the topic of discussion in our household for the past week because it has been infuriating and frustrating and we haven't been able to get anything else done because Eric is just like hanging out with these air conditioning guys trying to fix this problem and on the phone with them and on hold with them. And like, just, it's just been a whole mess. So we're very grateful that our upstairs unit is working because it's cool upstairs and some of that filters down into the downstairs area. So it's not like blazing hot. It's not uncomfortable. It's totally fine. It's just, we don't want our now upstairs unit to break because it's doing overtime to try to fix the downstairs. You know what I'm saying? So we're just trying to fix it before it becomes a bigger issue and a bigger problem. And it's just turned into this whole mess. So that's my very long winded version of who needs to relax this week. Um, <laughs> But you know who doesn't need to relax, guys, is our first sponsor. It's summertime, guys. You know what that means? It means the sun sets later. The days are longer. We get more pool time. We really love our pool time at this house. We go swimming very often with Flynn. But we usually go swimming later in the day because it is so hot here in Los Angeles. So we go swimming around like five-ish. And then by the time we get out of the pool, I'm like, ah, it's six, six thirty. So I don't want to like worry about making dinner and have all that hassle. It's such a pain in the booty, which usually means I end up eating like fast food or throwing a pizza in the oven. And that is no good. I need to make sure I'm nourishing my body and my babies and my son, you know, and making sure he's eating the things he needs to eat. But it's hard on these summer days where I just want to play outside with my kiddo. So that's why I'm so grateful for Daily Harvest. They come to the rescue, guys. It's honestly the best self-care routine I've ever had. Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, flatbread, smoothies, and more. I'm obsessed with the smoothies, guys. They're so good. All built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. So some of my favorites, the broccoli cheese harvest bowl. Oh man, what is the deal with broccoli and cheese? Like, why is that combination so good? I am... 
I love anything with broccoli and cheese. Like I want broccoli in my mac and cheese. I want broccoli and anything that has cheese and I want broccoli in it. Anything with broccoli, I want cheese in it. What is that? Why is that combination so good? Um, that's one of my favorites. And of course, I love all the smoothies. They're so delicious. Daily Harvest takes literally minutes to prepare and never uses preservatives, added sugar or artificial anything. And that goes for everything. My personal Summer favorite, of course, is Daily Harvest Scoops. Um, they are so good. They're plant-based ice cream. Flynn is obsessed with their ice cream. Uh, we make a little ice cream store and he is loving making his ice cream store with all the Daily Harvest Scoops. Scoops is the perfect sweet treat, plus it's gluten and dairy free. Daily Harvest is all about leaving the earth in a better place than they found it, not just for us, but for future generations to come. They focus on increasing biodiversity, investing in organic farming practices, reducing food waste, and even prioritizing recyclable and compostable packaging. Daily Harvest is delicious food, all built on whole organic fruits, vegetables that conveniently stay fresh in the freezer. So it's ready when you are. It's really the whole package. Get more time back to do you and take care of yourself this summer. Go to dailyharvest.com slash relax to get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash relax for up to $40 off your first box. dailyharvest.com slash relax. Alrighty. So I went ahead and, uh, went on our Twitter relax underscore podcast and asked you guys what you wanted to hear us talk about this week. And most people were asking Eric questions. You guys are very interested in Eric, which I understand and agree because he's way more interesting and cuter and just all around a better person than I am. So, um, that's why I'm really hoping for this episode. Hopefully he'll be willing to do an episode all by himself. I would be so curious to see how that goes, but uh, I know a lot of your questions were for Eric about Eric. And so I feel bad. You guys are just getting little on me, but, um, I do want to answer some of the questions that you guys sent in. You guys had a lot of great topic ideas, really fun stuff this week. So thank you. You guys basically planned the episode for me. I was a little stressed about doing it by myself and now I'm not. So the first one we're going to read is from Mackenzie Haugen. She said, read about weird, funny laws in California. I thought this would be a fun one to start off on because I don't know the weird, funny laws in California. And so I thought I need to look these up and I want to know what these weird, funny laws are. So let's get into it. Okay, guys, there's a lot of weird laws in California. I only read a couple of these. So a lot of these are going to be surprises for me as well. It is illegal in California for women to drive vehicles while wearing a house coat. What's a house coat? First of all, I don't even think I know what that is like a coat you wear in the house? Like, is that different than a regular coat? I feel like I need to look this up because I don't know what a house, like what's a house coat? What is a house coat? I'm searching for it right now. Let's see here. <gasps> Wait, what? <laughs> so a woman's often long skirted informal garment for wear around the house. It looks like a muumu, like a muumu type outfit. It's illegal to wear one of those. <gasps> Oh my gosh, I should do a video where I do illegal things and wear a muumu while driving. I didn't know that was illegal. Well, I mean, why would I know that's illegal? Um, another thing that is illegal is homeowners. This is in uh, the San Diego area. So I don't know if this is everywhere. I think it's just San Diego. And I would definitely get in trouble for this one. Homeowners who have Christmas lights on their houses past February 2nd may be subject to a fine of up to $250. Now, this poses a question. And the question is, how soon can you put up Christmas lights? Like, is there a fee if you put them up too early? Because that one I would definitely get in trouble for. Because I start decorating for Christmas like now. Like, it is very hard for me to not have my house covered in Christmas stuff right now. So I wonder if there, like, if there's a limit of when you can start as well. Because what if my Christmas stuff, what if I put it up February 4th? And I'm like, it's not up from Christmas. I'm just getting ready for Christmas early. Like, I wonder... I wonder that. But also, why is that a law? Like, who's the Grinch in San Diego that made that a law? Like, what a loser. It is illegal to pour salt on a... It is illegal to pour salt on a highway in Hermosa Beach. Why? That's so weird. I don't know. Like, I want to know... Here's the thing. Like, these laws are interesting and funny, but I want to know the reason behind them. Like, what made someone go into... Like, however, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm going to sound really freaking stupid, guys, but we all know I'm stupid. OK, I don't even really understand how laws are made, but I know it's a very complicated process and takes a lot of steps. 
So like what led this law to come to fruition? Like how did that happen? Like what person had an issue with salt being put on the highway? Was it an, I just want to know, like, anyway, in Long Beach, California, it is prohibited to put anything other than cars in a garage. (gasps) We would be arrested. I'd be in prison. I can't live in Long Beach. My, my garage is only garbage. My, (laughs) my garage is full of like haters back off props and costumes and sets and tons of weird stuff. Um, in Los Angeles, it is not legal to wash your neighbor's car if you've not gotten their permission. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Like I, I would think it was pretty weird if my neighbors just walked over to my cars and started washing them. Like, I feel like, I don't know that it should be illegal, but this seems kind of weird. So that one makes sense to me in Blythe, which I don't even know where Blythe is in Blythe, California, you are only permitted to wear cowboy boots. If you own at least two cows, that's crazy. Why are you got why you got to like gatekeep cowboy boots like that? You can only wear cowboy boots if you have two cows. That's kind of weird. All right, let's see. There's so many guys. I'm trying to figure out the the best ones to tell you. Peacocks have the right of way in Arcadia, including in driveways and all roadways. Now, I know this one is very specific. Like obviously it's very specific. Like that seems like a crazy law like peacocks have the right of way. But I feel like peacocks should always have the right of way. Like, I mean, am I crazy for thinking that? Like, I feel like animals should have the right of way. Like, I feel like it shouldn't be like a car can hit an animal and be like, well, I had the right of way because I'm the car. So it's the peacock's fault or it's the animal. Like, I feel like animals, like they should have the right of way. I don't know. I feel like it's because if the car has the right of way then like, can't they get in less trouble if like they hit the animal? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like that's like a reasonable law, but I just think it's weird that it's like specified as peacocks. Um, I guess you do have to specify though. Cause like, what if you run over like a rat or something, you didn't see it. And then you're, you get in trouble with the law because you ran over a rat that you didn't see. And the rat had the right of way. Um, I don't know. I guess you can't really miss a peacock. I don't know, guys. I have so many questions. Like, I'm never going to get through this list because I just have so many questions about these weird laws. I want to know how they came came to be. Um, let's see. Unless it is for amusement or drama, it is illegal for men and boys to dress. Whoa! This is gonna. This one makes me mad. How is this real? I can't even finish this sentence. <laughs> This one is infuriating. (gasps) Okay. Let me take a breath. Unless it is for amusement or drama, it is illegal for men and boys to dress as females in Walnut, California, without a permit from the sheriff. (gasps) What? Also, who gets to decide what is amusement or drama? Um... You know, like that's kind of a weird stipulation to have on the law, like unless it's for amusement or drama. So I'm guessing that means like if you're in a play or something like that. But that is wild that that is a law in California. That is disgusting, in my opinion. Like it's illegal to dress. And what does that mean to dress as a female? What does that mean? Because I'm a female and I'm wearing a hoodie and shorts. So what if a boy wears a hoodie and shorts? Does that mean he's dressing as a female? get a life that one. I'm going to, I need to move on. Cause I'm going to get in trouble with how angry that was making me. Um, flying a kite higher than 10 feet off the ground is also prohibited in Walnut. What? Who can fly a kite less than 10 feet off? The- What's wrong with Walnut? What's wrong? With Walnut, California. You need to get your stuff together. Cause that is your laws are very strange. It's illegal to fly a kite higher than 10 feet off the ground. What's the point of having a kite? That's not flying a kite. I am so confused. Okay. It is not legal to curse on a mini golf course in Long Beach. You can't say a bad word. Oh, I, again, I would get in so much trouble. There's a lot of laws that I could break in these places. Like I could do a whole video on like breaking laws. Um, okay. English, although I'm not encouraging that. I don't think we should all break laws except for the one about dressing as a female. That one makes me mad. Like that should not be a law. Okay. In Glendale, it is against the law to jump into or out of a moving vehicle. I mean, that's not that weird. Like, I feel like that should be illegal. Unless it's like you're trying to get away from an attacker or something who kidnapped you or something like, you know, that shouldn't, we shouldn't be jumping out of moving vehicles. Um, wait, 
What? It is also illegal to drive in reverse in Glendale? What is this? That's can't be Glendale's very close to to like the vicinity of where I live in Los Angeles. Like it's illegal to drive in reverse. Like at all? Like how do you back out of a parking spot? What is going on? Um, you may not hunt moths under street lamps in Los Angeles. I did not know that. These are wild. In Prunedale, California, two bathtubs cannot be installed in the same house. These these are blowing my mind. I mean, I have two bathtubs in my house, so I'm breaking the law here. If that law were here, women may not wear high heels while in Carmel city limits. Like Carmel? No. Wait, is that real? Like Carmel, California? I am. What? Is that real? These can't be real. I'm like, I'm very shook. Um, in Fresno, visitors cannot bother lizards at city parks. I like that law. That's fair law. Leave the, leave the lizards alone. In San Francisco, it is not legal to carry bread, cakes, or pastries that are intended for human consumption in open baskets or exposed containers. Wow. What? These laws are wild. Bowling is not legal on the sidewalk in Chico. Okay. See what, what? What what was the scenario that led to that decision? That's all I'm thinking about. Like who was bowling and dis and disrupting pedestrians or something so often? Like was there like a bowling league that was like, we don't need a bowling alley. We'll just bowl on the sidewalk outside our neighbor's house. And the neighbor just got so fed up with his like bowling team bowling outside their house every day that they're like, I'm turning this into a law. I'm calling the sheriff. Like, how did that become a law? That's I'm, I'm like more interested in the stories behind these laws and the actual laws themselves. Um, let's see in Berkeley. It is illegal to whistle for a lost canary before 7 a.m. Again, what happened to make this law? What person lost their canary and was whistling for the canary to come home every morning at like 5 a.m.? 6 a.m. and waking up their neighbors to the point where the neighbors all got together and were like, you guys, we got to go down to city council and make it a law that before 7 a.m. you can't be whistling for your lost canary. Like, this is so specific. Like, what happened? All right. Um, walking an elephant down Market Street in San Francisco is illegal unless the elephant is on a leash. <laughs> I mean, I would hope this would be illegal, but also when did this happen? Like, I just need to know. Um, I'm almost done. Just a couple more. It is against the law to have more than two cats or dogs in San Jose. <gasps> really? Oh my gosh, San Jose. Again, very close to where I live. I have family that have lived in San Jose and they had more than two cats and dogs. <gasps> Illegal. Oh my gosh. My relatives were breaking the law. They certainly had more than two cats and dogs. That's illegal in San Jose. Is that, I have to look these up now. Um, in San Francisco, any person classified as quote unquote ugly may not legally walk down any street. What? That is a real law. This blew my, this was a crazy. Thank you to whoever suggested that. That is crazy. What does that mean? Anyone who's legally like deemed ugly. McKenzie suggested this. And there's more too. That was just like the first thing that was the first article I clicked on, but like there are tons of articles about these laws and how weird they are. I feel like a lot of them are probably just really outdated, um, and just never got updated, never got fixed, um, never got taken down. Cause I'm sure it's a lot of work to like unmake a law, a law, <laughs> just like it's a lot of work to make a law, a law, which is why I just really want to know the backstory to all those laws. Like who saw an, in their opinion, an ugly person walking down the street in San Francisco and was like, that person is too ugly and got enough people to go to wherever they're supposed to go to make a law happen. And then all the lawmakers were like, yeah, that's a really good idea. Let's make it illegal for ugly people to walk down the street. And who gets to decide who is ugly? I mean, I guess maybe that's the, is it a joke law? Like that no one's really ugly. Like ugly is just, you know, it's all matter of opinion and it's not true anyway. Like what is ugly? Like no one is ugly. You know what I mean? Like, how, how do you decide? Like, the, does the police officer get to decide? Like, oh, you're an ugly person, so I'm giving you a ticket for being ugly and walking down the street? Like, has anyone been fined for being ugly and walking down the street in San Francisco? You know, I have so many questions. <laughs> I have so many questions, and I know I'm not going to get any answers. And 
I'm very sad Eric isn't here to bounce back and forth with me on this one because I feel like he would have a lot to say about all of these laws. Um, but before we move on to, there's some meaty stuff. I, some of these topics, guys, are really intense. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to dive into them too deeply. I'm, I'm a little nervous is what I'm trying to say about some of the topics that I've chosen for the um, podcast today that I'm about to get into. So I'm very excited for our next sponsor because I need to calm down. And the next sponsor is, of course, Calm, who we love so much. Our lives are so stressful and so hectic. It has been just so rough. I mean, dealing with these air conditioning people, (laughs) but my pregnancy has been so hard on both of us, honestly, like on Eric and me and trying to live through a twin pregnancy while having a child. Our lives are, I would say the most stressful they've ever been. And so to have things like the calm app to help calm us down on those really stressful nights where we can't sleep is so helpful. And for me, I have crazy symptoms that come out at night. Like right now I'm having really bad restless legs and leg cramps, insomnia. And while calm does not cure my restless legs or my leg cramps or my insomnia, it really helps so much for me to calm down and not panic and um, meditate for a minute. So we love the calm app here in this household. And so I'm excited to tell you about them. If you've been dreaming about a beach getaway, but you're nowhere near the ocean, you may need to get creative. With Calm, you can listen to the relaxing sounds of the waves and give yourself a break wherever you are. That's why we're partnering with Calm, the number one mental wellness app to give you the tools that improve the way you feel. Clear your head with guided daily meditations, improve your focus with Calm's curated music tracks, and drift off to dreamland with Calm's imaginative sleep stories. And if you go to calm.com slash relax, you'll get a limited time offer of 40% off off a Calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming and new content is added every week. Over 100 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds, sleep more, stress less, live better with Calm. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash relax. Go to calm.com slash relax for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com slash relax. All righty, let's get back into your guys's wonderful suggestions and questions. Some are funny, some are serious, some are intense. And I'm really missing Eric right now, but let's get into this. Unpopular Opinions um, asked me to talk about this. What made you decide to tell your families early that you are pregnant? I'm five weeks, found out a few days ago. Congratulations. And I want to tell everyone, but my husband is hesitant. Much love. So here's the deal. This one is controversial, I guess, but I feel like it's important to talk about. So people advise in our society to not talk about your pregnancy until you're past the first trimester. And I even kind of thought this way just because that is what I was told um, in my pregnancy with Flynn. I waited till my first trimester was over, even though I was like just dying to tell everybody. I told my family and friends But everyone said, like, don't talk about it. Don't say anything until you're past the first trimester. And the reason people say that is because once you're past the first trimester, the chances of losing the pregnancy, losing the baby are much lower. And so in that first trimester, it's just it's possible that something really sad can happen. And. And the and the more I have experienced in life since being pregnant with Flynn the more research I've done and then experiencing a miscarriage myself, um, I realized how unfair that is to teach that and tell that to women. I think it is your choice. If you get pregnant, when you can tell people that you are pregnant, you get to make that decision for yourself, what is best for you and your family. And for me, I knew I wanted to tell everyone I was pregnant the second I found out I was pregnant (laughs) because I wanted my family and friends support for my pregnancy. But also if something bad did happen for me and, and who I am as a person, I knew I would need their support and help through that awful, awful thing that I was going through. Um, if something bad were to happen. And so I remember when I got pregnant, the pregnancy that I lost, um, 
Eric and I talking about like, okay, should we tell our families? And I was like, I want to tell my mom right now. I want to tell my sister. I want to tell everybody. And he was like, aren't we supposed to wait? Like he even said it because that's what you're taught. You're taught you're supposed to wait. Um, and I said, well, you're supposed to wait in case something bad happens. But if something bad happens, I would tell my family and friends anyway, because I'd want their support. And so I told my family and friends that I was pregnant and then I lost the baby. And I was so grateful that I had that community of people who were excited for me and who knew. And actually it was so much harder to, um, tell people who like, there were a couple of friends who didn't know I was pregnant and then I needed their advice and their support and their help through the miscarriage. And so I had to tell them I had a miscarriage when they didn't even know I was pregnant. And to me, that was harder, like to explain to them I was pregnant and now I've lost it. Um, I, I didn't like that at all. So for me, it was better to have already told them I was pregnant to have them be excited and, and share that pregnancy with me. Um, and then mourn the pregnancy with me. So that was my personal choice with Eric. And that's what I think you should do. Like, um, I mean, so it's, it's completely up to you. I think it's unfair that society tells you when you're allowed to tell people that you're growing a human in your body. Like no one should tell you when you get to make that choice, but you, you're growing a human in your body. That's a big deal. And if you would rather keep that to yourself and give, keep it private between you and your husband or you and your partner, um, then that's your choice. And that's a great choice. But if you know, like, I want to tell, I want to celebrate this pregnancy. Hopefully it's the whole pregnancy, but if something, you know, is going to happen, like I still want those, all these people to know about it. I think that's completely fair and fine. I think the reason that people say don't tell is because for some people it's too hard to tell others that you've gone through a, a miscarriage or something hard that has happened. And so the more people you tell, the more people you're going to have to then explain that something negative happened. And so you just have to make that choice for yourself of like, if you want to tell everyone, if something bad does happen, which is a horrible thing to have to think, um, you know, you're going to have to now tell these people that this, this awful thing has happened. So it's a very touchy subject. And, but I, I think it's completely up to you and you shouldn't listen to what society teaches us about like, how dare you tell people that you're pregnant before the first trimester is over? I got that even with the twins because I told everyone early with the twins um, because I was just so excited. <laughs> I I told the internet pretty early on that I was pregnant um, with the twinsies and I was so excited. I was starting to show and I'd also experienced something really scary where I was bleeding and I thought I was having a miscarriage and then I wasn't. And then I found out it was twins and I was just, people were figuring it out anyway. And so, um, you know, because there were so many signs that I was having twins. Uh, so people were figuring it out anyway. And I, and I wanted to share it with the internet. I was so excited. So I made that decision and, um, that was my decision to make with my husband. And that's how I feel about that. So, um, I understand your husband's hesitancy. Um, but is his hesitancy because of what society has taught us? Because my husband was the same way. He was like, well, aren't we supposed to not tell anyone yet? Um, but it's just cause that's what he had heard. And, um, you know, I think for him, it would be harder to tell everyone, you know, I mean, I don't want to speak for him. He's not here, but I think it'd be harder for him to have to then explain every, to everyone that there was a, a, a loss than for me where I like, I need to talk about it and talk through it with my family and friends. So, um, you know, it's, it's up to you guys together. And I think if you want to celebrate your pregnancy, even if you're only five weeks, like you're five weeks pregnant with a human. You should celebrate that. That's my feeling. And I could talk about this for obviously forever. So I'm going to move on. <laughs> um, actually let's, let's keep it in the area of baby land. Cause I got a tweet. I'm not going to say from who, cause I don't want any drama. I'm not trying to call anyone out and I'm not even going to read the tweet. I'm just going to give you the gist of what it said. And it basically is the gist is like, <laughs> why are you having babies? <laughs> in 2021 when the world is falling apart like isn't that a bad idea like you shouldn't do that essentially and normally i don't respond to like negative stuff and i probably shouldn't um but this one just struck me as like i don't think this person was trying to be mean or any i, I don't know but i i want to respond with like what was your intention 
with that tweet because what do you want me to do? Like, I, I definitely should not be responding to this. <laughs> I make I make a point to like never respond to like try not to respond to negative stuff. But this person said it a couple times, and um, I don't want anything negative towards this person because I I want to believe they had good intentions. But like, what do you expect me to do now? Like, what? I'm not going to get rid of my babies like that are growing in me. And if you think it's a bad idea to not have kids, if you think it's a bad idea to have kids in 2021, then you should not have kids in 2021. That's your decision. That's your right. And I do think that like, it's a scary world we're living in. And, um, it is terrible. Eric and I talk about constantly, like, what's the, what is the world we're leaving for our children in 50 years, in a hundred years, in 30 years? Like, what's the world going to look like? Cause a lot of scary stuff is happening in the world. And I totally agree with that, which is why I think it's an important conversation to have to like make changes and make a difference to make the world a better place and a safer place for future generations because it's falling apart. But I think maybe it's not a good idea to tell a pregnant woman who is growing babies that it's a bad idea for her to be growing babies and bringing babies into the world. While maybe that's a conversation you could have with someone who's thinking about having kids and is not currently pregnant, if she asks your opinion, but to tell it to someone who is currently pregnant with two humans to say what you're doing, it's a bad idea. You shouldn't do that. I think is a bad move. Like I just think it's what do you want me to do? Like, what is your suggestion here? Because I just don't, I just thought it was like, it made me, it made me laugh. I wasn't like mad or hurt by it. I was just like, what does this person think? What, are, what was your intention behind asking me this question? I guess is my point. Like, do you want me to get rid of my children? Like, I don't understand what, like, what is your intention asking a pregnant woman this question? I just blew my mind. And I've seen obviously way worse stuff, um, pointed at me and comments sent my way. Uh, obviously in my lifetime and in my career, but this one, I don't know. I just, I'm, I really want to believe this person didn't have bad intentions and I'm not wishing this person any negativity or, um, nothing bad because I, I really do think maybe this person had good intentions and it's just trying to like make the world a better place. I mean like, Hey, our world is falling apart. Like, um, and I agree with that. So like, I feel like, you know, if that's your intention, like, oh man, yes. Thank you for helping try to spread the word about like, let's help this, the climate crisis and and the world is just a total disaster and falling apart. Like there's so much work to be done. And I totally agree with that. And so if that's your intention, like I thank you for spreading the word, but I just think there's a better way to do it than tell a pregnant woman. It's a bad idea to have babies when she's currently pregnant. (laughs) I probably shouldn't respond, but I just couldn't resist. So maybe I'll get in trouble for that one, but I hope not. I wish that person the best. And, um, I thought it was a funny thing to say to a pregnant woman. Um, all right, let's see. There are so many other things you guys. Oh, here's a good one. Jane said, Colleen, are you thinking of getting a psychic reading about the twins? Like you did when you were pregnant with Flynn sending my love. Yes. We, I want her to come back and do a reading of the twins, but with COVID stuff, um, which I don't want to get into all that right now. Cause it's so political and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, we, Eric and I are both fully vaccinated and our son is not because he's not eligible because he's two. And there's a lot of variants out there right now that are scary. And I know everyone has different opinions on all of that, but our personal choice and our personal opinion is to just continue to take things very seriously to protect, um, our kids multiple, because even though I'm vaccinated, there's still a chance that like I could catch it and there's still a chance that it could do something to my babies and, um, do something to Flynn. And so we're just being as careful as we can and minimizing our travels, our interactions with other people. Um, we're just trying to do what's best for our personal family. And I know that's different for everyone. We are privileged enough to be able to do that. And so we're just waiting to like have lots of interactions with people. So, um, we will meet up with Terry, the psychic very soon, but right now we're just being extremely cautious and safe and just kind of not seeing anybody. (laughs) 
Um, so not that Terry's not safe. She's very safe. And like all of our friends and family are very safe, but we're just being a little like intense about it. Um, and that's our personal choice. So, um, and we respect and admire all of your personal choices as well. I'm not saying anything. Let's not make this all intense and whatever. Anyway, I think it's time for an ad because I just want to change the subject. So let's move on to our next sponsor, which is Indeed Inc. You have to hire someone with the exact skills you need to help your business. How do you know who's really best for the role? Save time and screen for quality candidates with the skills you need with Indeed assessments. When hiring gets hard, you need Indeed, the job site that makes hiring incredibly simple. You just attract, interview, and hire. In fact, with Indeed, you can do all of your hiring in one place, even interviewing. Don't just hope your perfect candidate will find you. Indeed's hiring tools help you cut through the noise to hire faster and smarter. In fact, Indeed Instant Match provides a list of quality candidates whose resumes are on Indeed the moment you post a sponsored job. With Indeed Assessments, choose from 135 skill tests to help make sure you're finding applications from people with the skills you need. They make it so easy, guys. This is amazing. According to Talent Nest, Indeed delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined. This is the place to go, y'all, if this is what you need, because hello, hello. Four times more hires? Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash relax. Did you hear me, guys? Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash relax. That's Indeed.com slash relax. Offer valid through September 30th. Terms and conditions may apply. All right, back to your suggestions and questions. This next one really interested me. So we're going to try it out. Ashley said, please do your Enneagram personality test. I've never even heard of this. Me and all my friends have done it and it's incredibly accurate. So I'd never heard of this before. An Enneagram personality test. So I'm going to do it with you guys right now. Enneagram personality test. Okay. So, um, I don't know if I'll do the whole thing on the podcast with you because I don't know how many questions there are. But apparently this is a a test that tells it says this free personality test will show you which of the nine personality types suit you best. See how you score for all nine types and understand where you fit in the Enneagram personality system. Why why do I need to know this? All right. So it's going to ask me a series of questions right now. So, for example, I strive for perfection. I would say that's accurate, but not completely. It depends on the project. I don't know. I'm going to say it's pretty accurate. I work hard to be helpful to others. I would say that is pretty accurate. It's important for me that other people like me. That's very accurate. (laughs) It is important to me to achieve great things. That is very accurate. I make, it's not that I achieve it, but I do wish that for myself. I make more significant contributions than the average person. I don't know. I guess pretty accurate. Do I? I don't know what that, I don't know. I feel my emotions very deeply. Oh my God, that is accurate. I have a sense that other people will never truly understand me. Uh, I'd say I'm in the middle about that. I don't know. I think deeply about things. That's pretty accurate. I'm prepared for any disaster. That is not accurate. (laughs) It is important. Sorry, this is boring probably for you guys. I should do this off camera um, and just redo the results. But these are the types of questions it's asking. It's important for me to avoid pain and suffering at all times. That's very accurate. I don't want to feel any pain or suffering ever. I hate it. I seek out experiences that I know will make me feel happy and excited. That is very accurate. Um, Welcome to a dopamine deficiency. I see the positive, which by the way, I'm not going to get into this right now. (laughs) But I don't even think I should get into it at all. Um, it's I've seen some comments. Oh, I should not get into it. I'm going to say I'm I, this. This is why we need Eric in the podcast. I'm going to start saying things I should not say. Um, but I have seen some people say things just because it's like I feel like it's become trendy almost to say you have ADHD, and um, I'm not going to speak for everyone because. I don't, I don't know. I'm just going to talk about my personal experience, but like, it's really frustrating (laughs) to see people say that about me when I have literally been diagnosed by multiple doctors and have been medicated for it and have been in therapy for it for years. 
And it is not something that is cute and quirky that I like. I'm just forgetful and <laughs> silly, quirky me. Like it is like debilitating, awful <laughs> like at times like where I've like had like serious breakdowns because I'm so upset that my brain works so differently than other people, especially now that I'm off my medication. I, it is what has caused me to have anxiety. It is what has caused me to have depression. It is what has made my dermatillomania happen because that is how I, um, I wasn't super hyper as a kid. Like how I, I focused my hyperactivity was through ripping off my own skin. Like I was, that was my way of masking. My hyperness was like the, um, the picking of my skin, which has obviously become a huge issue for me. Um, I should not be talking about this at all right now. It just really bothers me. <laughs> that I've seen people be like, you just say you're ADHD because it's trendy. I'm like, okay, Sarah or whatever your name is out there. People who say, I just assume they're all named Sarah, nothing against Sarah's. I'm sure Sarah's are nice. Um, but, um, I've known a lot of nice Sarah's please don't cancel me for that. Uh, I'm just saying it's very hurtful and frustrating to see that. And I think it is just because there's a lot of people thinking it's cute and silly to like say they have ADHD when they don't know how serious it can be and how debilitating it can be and how much it really um, interrupts your life and uh, makes life very difficult. And I'm not blaming. Oh, my God. I should not be talking about this. Let's get back to the stupid personality test. I'm sorry. See, welcome to my ADHD. Where I, get, I, can't, I can't even just take this test without like getting okay anyway sorry this is why i wish eric was here oh my god i'm a mess okay moving on i see the positive in every situation and i can i actually feel like i do but i don't know um i'm not afraid to tell someone when i think they're wrong uh i'm very afraid to tell people when i think they've done something wrong i let other people make my decisions no i well no. Um, all right. So it says there's this, all the questions I just answered, that was one of six pages. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to answer all these and I'm going to tell you my results. Oh my God. And I'm going to not get sidetracked about ADHD rants. I apologize for that. Here we go. Okay. This is infuriating. It's like 20 minutes later and I finished the questions just to be led to, it's like, get your results. And then it shows me a little pie chart. But in order to see what it means, I have to pay $20? Are you serious? I didn't know this was going to cost $20. So I'm not paying it because I'm stubborn. And I just spent thousands of dollars on my air conditioning. But I did look up my little pie chart, what it looks like and what I'm guessing. And then I looked up the anagram, like um, the thing that explains the pie chart. And it looks like I have mostly, like the things that are the most full <laughs> is number the numbers two, three, nine, and seven. Three is the most. And so I'm looking at this little in in the anagram, in the anagram chart here. And it says that number three is the achiever, which is the one that's has the most in my pie chart, is number three. Success oriented, pragmatic type, adaptable, excelling, driven, and image conscious, which I guess is true. And number two is like a uh, close second, which is the helper. And the, which is the caring interpersonal type, demonstrative, generous, people pleasing and possessive. And then um, number nine and seven are also pretty high up there for me. So number nine is the peacemaker, easygoing, self-effacing type, receptive, reassuring, agreeable and complacent. <laughs> uh, true. I hate confrontation. Seven is the enthusiast, the busy, fun, loving type, spontaneous, versatile, distractible and scattered. That is very accurate. So those are like my top four moments of my pie chart um, with number one and six being the smallest pieces of my pie. So let's see what those are, because now I'm interested to see what I'm not. The reformer. I am not the reformer, which is number one, which is, is this making any sense to anyone? Should I not have done this? Um, the rational, idealistic type, principled, purposeful, self-controlled and a perfectionist. OK, thanks. Is that a diss or a compliment? Number six, I'm not very much. Um, oh, this one's sad. <laughs> the loyalist. What? I'm not loyal. I'm a Scorpio. Scorpios are supposed to be loyal. I feel like I'm loyal. Um, but this was like one of the smallest pieces of my pie, my pie chart. And says the committed security oriented type, engaging, responsible, anxious, and suspicious. Okay. Ugh. I guess I'm not any of those things or I am just not very much. 
Um, also eight was pretty small. So let's see what that is. The challenger, the powerful dominating type, self-confident, decisive, willful, and confrontational. That's accurate. I'm not confrontational. Um, I'm also not very decisive. I don't know. Was that interesting? Or did it just make me go on a weird ADHD rant? That's like, was embarrassing. <laughs> I don't know if that was a horrible idea. I feel like I need Eric. <laughs> I feel like me doing a podcast by myself is a horrible idea. So I'm really sorry guys that this episode is terrible. Cause like, I thought that was gonna be way more interesting. Cause I thought I would be able to read funny results to you, but instead I'm just like, I got a pie chart that doesn't make much sense. And, um, yeah, I don't really know what to do with it. Like, okay. So they kind of told me personality traits that we kind of all knew about me already. So I don't know. Was that interesting? Probably not. Let's get into something more interesting. Okay. Okay. So this one might be, this one's gonna, this is the one I probably shouldn't talk about. I feel like this podcast episode should be called like, I shouldn't talk about this, (laughs) but, um, it just reached out to me and I felt like it was an interesting conversation. Hopefully it's not too controversial. Um, but I do think this is an interesting conversation to have. So, Jamina said, I don't know if this would be too personal, but maybe can you talk about, will you teach your kids religion or some aspects of it at least, or will you prefer just teaching them kindness and good values, but without religion itself? Now, I'm not necessarily going to answer this question. (laughs) I, I'm just going to tell you a little deeper into like my experience with religion growing up. And that is why I'm a little scared. This is a topic that like, it's hard to talk about religion because it's such a personal, sensitive thing. And, um, so I just think it's, I, the reason it's on my mind, the reason this, this suggestion jumped out at me is because I've been talking about it in therapy a little bit lately. And, um, I love my therapist. I think she's amazing. And she knows, you know, my, my background and my history and my life. I've been going to her for a while. And, um, so we kind of covered all that at the beginning of our therapy. And then, you know, we've gone down other road since then. And recently she brought something up that was very interesting that I had never realized before. And we've been working on something with me. We're going to get deep right now, guys. Okay. So (laughs) is anyone still listening? (laughs) I don't know. Um, if you are listening, you're about to hear all about my therapy sessions. (laughs) Um, and you're about to hear about religion and my experience with religion in a more deep way than I think I've talked about it before. Um, so Uh, we're working on something. I will try to not go off on too many tangents right now, but we're working on how I, um, kind of am my biggest bully in my own head is like the simplest way I can put it. So for example, if I, um, if I do anything wrong or even feel a, a sad emotion, um, anything that is not just happy and, and succeeding, I, in my own head, beat myself up quite a bit and tell myself I'm stupid or an idiot or whatever in my own brain. This this is my first thoughts. And so we've been working on this, how I just kind of beat myself up and how I need to be more compassionate towards myself and let myself feel down and, and, and be kind to myself and, and things like that. And this is something I think a lot of people struggle with. Um, but it is a, pretty serious issue with me. And, um, even to the point where if someone, if someone compliments me or says something kind to me, I like in my head immediately, I'm like, Oh, they're lying to me. They're, they're lying to you, Colleen. Like, don't listen to them. Like you're stupid and you're ugly and you're the worst. And you know, like these are the things that I say to myself in my own brain. And so this is something we are working on because this is not healthy. And so, um, you know, we've been talking about why that is and how to, kind of rewire my brain a little bit so that I can be kinder to myself. And in recent therapy sessions, she has brought up how, you know, I've, I've had a pattern in the past of putting people in my life who like to bring me down. Luckily I've kind of, I've grown out of that pattern so that the people in my life now are just loving, kind people who are nice to me. Um, but she said, it seems like that's a pattern because that's been something that has happened to you since you were a little girl. Like you've been taught to talk to yourself this way from even when you were a little girl. And I was like, no, my family is so loving and wonderful. She's like, I'm not talking about your family. Um, she's like the way you described your religious experience sounded like this. And I was like, what? And I didn't even realize it, but for me personally, I'm not talking about religion in general. I need to put this disclaimer out there that I think religion any religion and being a religious person 
can be a beautiful, important, necessary thing. I think it is, it's, it's beautiful. And some of the things that can be taught within religion and some of the things that religion has done for people, I think is so important and so magical, me included. Like, um, so many wonderful things in my life are because of things I was learned and taught and felt from, you know, my upbringing. And, and I went to a re- private religious college and, um, and all that. So I don't want anyone to think I'm talking like this is a blanket statement about um, religion. I'm just, I'm only speaking, this is my disclaimer. I'm talking about me and my personal experience and how my brain um, computed what I was learning in Sunday school. So for me, (laughs) not generally and not what everyone feels and what everyone thinks, but how my brain works is it's very extreme. When I feel emotions, they are all consuming, extreme. It is black and white. Um, and it is, it's all consuming. It's very overwhelming. And so when I was in Sunday school and in church my whole life, learning things and reading things in the Bible and hearing things from pastors and hearing things in worship songs that were telling me constantly, I am not worthy. I am not good enough for God, but he loves me anyway, even though I am nothing and I am a sinful, bad person. And God still loves me even because of that. You know, the takeaway from that should have been like, hey, we all mess up. Like we all have our faults, but he still chooses to love you. That is not how my little immature young brain let that settle in my mind as a kid. And even as an adult in college, um, it settled in my brain as I am worthless, scum, awful. I should never think anything positive of myself because the Bible says I'm bad. My church says I'm bad. There's nothing good about myself. And if I think that there's something good about myself, I am cocky. I am selfish. I am narcissistic. I am disgusting. So I can't think anything good about myself because then God will be disappointed in me. I am worthless. And that was what I, that was my takeaway from my experience. This is me personally. I am not saying in general. Me personally, that is how my brain soaked up that information from a very young age. And so now as an adult woman, (laughs) trying to undo that has been really hard. And it was, it's been very damaging for me in my life and hard for me in my life and and caused a lot of issues um, because that is what I believed. And so, um, and I, even though I'm not a church goer these days, I'm not going to get into where I'm at these days in my mind and in my brain, um, with that, because I don't want that discussion to come about, about like, (laughs) I think that is personal, my, my journey with religion or not, um, and with God or whatever you believe in, um, that is personal. And I, I don't want this discussion to become that in the comment section. Um, I'm just, I'm just letting you know my personal experience. And I think it's different for everyone and everyone can have good experiences and bad experiences with religion and the church. And, um, my experience, I had a lot of great experiences, but it also was kind of the best word I can think of in this scenario was like brainwashing me to think I was to believe I was the scum of the earth. And, um, that is not something I want my children to think about themselves. <laughs> and I'm not saying that they would if they were to go to church because everyone is different and every, and every scenario is different. Every situation is different. Every church is different. Every person's brain is different. And I think that everyone needs different things and everyone thrives from different experiences and different things. Um, but the way that I felt my whole life and the way I currently am battling feeling is something I don't wish on anyone because it sucks. And so, um, but it was, it was very shocking and eye opening for me to be in therapy in the last few weeks and kind of make this realization that this isn't something new that is happening to me now. This is something I've been doing for forever. 
because it was like implanted in my brain at such a young age. You know, for, I remember being three years old and um, learning about hell and learning that I was, you know, I wanted Jesus to come live in my heart and become a Christian because otherwise for eternity, I would not see my family. I would just burn in flames. And that was a very scary thought. And, um, from that point on, even though I was a Christian, I thought maybe that's what I deserved and that's where I would end up. And that's not a fun way to think. Um, and so, um, anyway, <laughs> I just, this is the only reason I'm talking about this is because it's something that was recently brought up in, um, therapy for me. And it was like a big realization of like, oh, that's why my brain is wired that way. That's why I beat up, beat myself up so much. Um, that's where it started at least. And that was an interesting thought. And I, I, I get a lot of questions about my religious past and how I feel about religion. And, and, um, I don't have any resentment or anger or negative feelings towards religion. I like in that sense, because of my experience, I think that's how my brain interpreted and took in that information. And it wasn't good for me and hasn't been good for me. Um, be just because of how my, how I soaked up that info and, um, how it has affected me long-term and you can see it in my prayer journals from age 13 up until past college, where every prayer journal entry, every diary entry is, I'm not worthy. I am awful. I am so sorry, God. I Today, I, I felt like I cared more about what people thought of me than what you thought of me. And I'm such a bad sinner and I'm such an awful person. And um, thank you for loving me, even though I'm awful. You know, it was it was so focused on that, on how awful I was and how terrible I was. And I was I was a goody two shoes, guys. <laughs> I didn't do I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. I didn't have sex. I didn't do any of the things you were told not to do in church, I was a goody two shoes. Um, and I found reasons why I was awful. So anyway, I just wanted to bring this up as I just thought it was an interesting conversation and hopefully it can stay a kind conversation. Um, but it just kind of, it was just an interesting thing to think about how like the same religion that can like, um, change someone's life and make them a better person and make them a kinder, loving, um, more giving, just wonderful person is the same religion that to another person who's completely different could, um, make them hate themselves for their entire life. <laughs> and so, it's just, I think it's just an interesting thing to think about, like how we're all so different and like our brains are all so different and we all take in information so differently and how interesting that is. And, um, like I said, I don't think religion is this all bad thing. I think it can be so beautiful and so necessary and so wonderful. Um, but you know, the way I experienced it, um, did some hurtful things in my brain and, and my heart. And, and that's, that's life. Like, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying anything good or bad. I'm just, I'm just bringing up like that that is something I think about now because I'm learning about it in therapy, but I'm curious to know your thoughts if they are kind and constructive. Like I would love to hear what you guys think about this topic. Um, I'm, I'm nervous to talk about it at all because it's obviously controversial to bring up religion in any capacity, but also, um, because I'm not taking, I feel like you have to take a side firmly one way or the other. When you talk about these things, like I am a firm devout religious person or like, no, that's not, I don't believe that at all. And here's why. Um, I feel like I don't do that. I kind of, I see both sides and, um, I think that's an issue probably for a lot of people that seems probably more con controversial than like picking one way or the other. Um, so anyway, I would love to know your thoughts if we can keep them kind and, um, loving just on this idea in general on like how the same religion can have so many different effects and impacts on so many people. It's done a lot of harm. Um, I've seen it growing up in the church. Like I I've seen a lot of harm done and I've seen a lot of good. Um, so 
yeah, I don't know. I just thought that I don't, it'd be much easier to have this conversation if there's another human being here to like go back and forth with, but curious to know what you guys think about all this. Um, and I should probably stop talking about it before I say something I shouldn't, but, um, here we go. I'm going to actually, I need to say thank you to our final sponsor. <laughs> what a transition. <laughs> Um, but it is time to say thank you to our final sponsor of the episode, which is Flamingo. Okay, Flamingo body hair. <laughs> what a what a transition, guys. We'll go from religion to body hair. But here's the thing: body hair. We all have it. It's beautiful. We all have it. We all love it. Some people love it, some people don't, actually. Let's be honest. Um, and that's okay. If you love it, I think body hair is beautiful. Keep it all over your body. That's It's supposed to be there. That's why I grew there. But some people want to get rid of it. I'm one of those people. And that's okay too. It is your personal choice if you want to keep your body hair or get rid of your body hair. Both are beautiful options. But if you like to get rid of your body hair, Flamingo can help you out. Now, I don't know if you guys know about this, but I'm pregnant. And being pregnant makes body hair removal process much more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do like to remove my body hair. And so I'm very grateful for Flamingo because it's making my life so much easier now that I'm pregnant and I can barely see anything when I'm getting rid of body hair because there's a big old tummy in the way and there's, it's just a process. So, uh, that's why I'm very excited to be partnered with Flamingo today. Flamingo is a body care brand that offers a full range of quality, affordable hair removal products, like their award-winning razor and easy to use wax kits. Go to shopflamingo.com slash quiz to answer a few short questions about your hair removal habits. Then Flamingo suggests a customer routine just for you with a Flamingo subscription. Everything gets delivered right to your door automatically, including blade refills for less than $2 a cartridge. You can adjust your subscription as you go or cancel anytime hassle-free. I love this. I love any company that does these little quizzes for you. It makes life so much easier because then you get your subscription personalized just to you because there's so many products out there. There's so many things out there. It's hard to know what's right for you and your body and your skin. Flamingo makes that so much easier. It's really wonderful. I personally like the ingrown spot treatment because in the past I've had an obsession with getting the, the, those ingrown hairs. They're, they're pesky. They're annoying. And I will dig at them and cause big issues with ingrown hairs. I think we've all been there. At least most of us, me and my friends, maybe this is not a normal thing, but me and my friends talk about how we will, we will do anything to get those ingrown hairs. Like we will get an ax out, a hatchet. And this ingrown spot treatment is so nice because it takes care of it so that I'm not causing huge problems in my skin where those ingrown hairs are. It is really, really wonderful. The Flamingo razor has been so nice for me now that my belly's so big and I can barely stand on one leg at a time. So when I was using a different razor, I cut myself a lot, but this one is so much nicer. It has a weighted ergonomic handle, flexible hinge. It's so much nicer. So I cut myself way less when I can't really see what I'm doing. Um, it's super nice. It also is such an affordable price. It makes things just so much easier all the way around. Like my shaving routine is so much easier now. And it's nice to know that it's also affordable and um, it's just making life a little bit easier for my big old pregnant self while I'm doing my hair removal routine. Why was it so hard for me to say I'm all hair removal routine? <laughs> okay. Anyway. So are you ready for the smoothest summer ever? Take the quiz at shopflamingo.com slash relax to discover your custom hair removal routine. And you'll save an extra 10% off your first order when you subscribe using code relax at checkout. That's shopflamingo.com slash relax. Promo code relax. Okie dokie. Moving on <laughs> from my man. This episode has been all over the place. Um, I don't know what to expect from this. I don't know if this, this has been a nightmare. Jeez Louise. Okay. I miss Eric. Eric will be back next week. I promise. Um, so I'm going to talk about one little, one more thing, one little thing. Ari asked ghost experiences and a lot of people wanted me to talk about my ghost experiences. I've had a lot of ghost experiences. I've talked about all of my ghost experiences online. I think in random videos, um, I have talked about how in college, again, I went to a religious school and, um, there was a girl in my dorm where her poster of Britney Spears on her wall, like her roommate got, um, possessed. So they say, and then the poster like melted off the wall, like the face of Britney Spears, like dripped down and like poster mother, we all had to leave the dorm so they could pray over the dorm. I have personally seen a ghost or something in my dorm room before, um, on sleeping in my bunk bed in the bunk above me. Um, I've told, I've told most of these stories. Maybe I'll go into more depth in the podcast 
another day with Eric. We've, we always talk about telling ghost stories, but since I just talked so much about religion (laughs) and in a weird way, I don't know how that's going to come across. I'm a little nervous about it. So please be gentle with me guys. But, um, since I did just talk so much about religion, I thought it would be nice to talk about what I've always remembered as an angel experience. Um, so I think when you are religious, you are more prone to spiritual things happening to you. And, and what I was taught was that was because, um, you know, obviously God has his angels who protect you and you can feel them or sometimes. And, but also when you are religious and devoting your life to God, Satan will come after you harder. And so then you might have more demonic um, experiences if you're open to that. Basically, only if you're open to it will you experience that kind of stuff. Anyway, I don't think I've ever talked about this online, um, but uh, I had an experience that I believed was an angel when I was very young. I, I think I was probably 10. And, um, and I, it wasn't like I, I believed I knew it was like, I was, it wasn't like, I think that was an angel. It was like, I knew that it was. (laughs) And now looking back, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was a ghost, who knows. But, um, it actually like, it was one of the things that like solidified my devoutness to my religion because I was like, well, God sent an angel to take care of me. So I know God is real and I'm that, you know, like he proved himself to me. So I had a very, very hard time as a kid spending the night at anyone else's house. I would get very homesick. I was very attached to my parents. And anytime I ever tried to spend the night at anyone's house, I would call my parents crying and beg to come home. I I couldn't do it. Like I couldn't sleep at other people's houses until high school. And I'm not kidding. Even my grandparents' house, like I would freak out at my grandparents' house. Um, and so I was at my grandma's house. I think I was about 10. And, um, I wanted to go home and I, I begged, I said, I was sobbing and I was like, please grandma, I want to go home. I miss my mom. I miss my mom. And she just really wanted me to stay there. She knew I was going to be okay. And she was right. She knew I would have fun if I stayed and she could make me breakfast in the morning. We could go to the beach and do all this fun stuff. She knew I would have fun if I just stayed. And, um, she just kept saying, you're just tired. You're just tired. Just go to sleep. And I couldn't, I was just sobbing, begging to call my mom and go home. I just wanted to go home so bad. And she said, I'll come in your room with you. So she came in the guest room with me where I was sleeping on the bed and I'm crying. And she was like, I'll rub your back. And so she started rubbing my back and I'm going to cry because I miss my grandma. I never talk about her. But anyway, she was rubbing my back, um, just being so sweet, trying to keep me calm and like get me to fall asleep. Oh man, I am so pregnant guys, because now my mind is just thinking about that's how I get Flynn to sleep. (laughs) And then my grandma used to do it to me. Oh my God, I'm so pregnant. I'm going to cry. Oh my goodness. These pregnancy emotions are so wild. Like anything just like this, just, and I will start crying. I'm so emotional. Um, but yeah, I just, I haven't made that connection yet. Like that's how I get Flynn to go to sleep. He asked me to rub his back and my grandma used to do it to me anyway. Okay. (laughs) I'm such a mess. This story is not about that. This story is about an angel. (laughs) So, um, I, I don't, I don't remember too vividly what happened after that, but I just know that my grandma was there and she just rubbed my back for a second. And then I remember she like stopped, but my eyes were closed and then she started rubbing my back again and she was rubbing my back for a long time. And I felt warm and calm and I stopped crying and I felt okay. And I was, I remember I was praying. I was like, I, please let me be okay. Please let me fall asleep. Like, please let me say grandma's like I'm praying. Um, and then I opened my eyes to like talk to my grandma and she wasn't in the room and she had left. So clearly my grandma started off rubbing my back. She thought I'd fallen asleep and she left the room, but I never stopped feeling someone rubbing my back. Like I felt someone still like rubbing my back and calming me down and keeping me calm. And, and I opened my eyes and grandma was gone and I could, and when I opened my eyes, the, the rubbing stopped. I couldn't feel the rubbing on my back anymore. And I closed my eyes again and I felt the rubbing continue on my back. And I felt just a presence of like, you're okay. Like you're safe. I'm going to keep you safe and you're safe here. You can fall asleep. And I remember being so young 
and knowing that God had sent an angel <laughs> to help me feel safe so that I could fall asleep in my grandma's house. And now as an adult, I look back on that and go like, I think he had more, there's so many more important things to do <laughs> than send me an angel to make sure I felt like not homesick at my grandma's house. But I really firmly believed that. And like, I, I really did feel like I remember feeling like someone was really in the room with me rubbing my back. But when I opened my eyes, there was nobody there, but it really felt like there was a calm, warm presence in the room with me that I wasn't afraid of. I remember thinking there's an angel in here and I wasn't afraid of that. I was like, I just felt calm and I felt safe and I fell asleep. And I think it was the first time I was ever, ever able to fall asleep at someone else's house. But, um, yeah, I, I had multiple experiences like that, you know, in, in my childhood and high school and college, a lot of a mostly terrifying demon or ghost experiences. But um, I had a few that were like that as well, that felt like it was an angel protecting me or God protecting me or something like that. But I never have talked about those experiences. I always talk about like the demonic ones because I got a lot of those and they're really freaking scary. I one time had I don't get too into it, y'all, but I've talked about this before in like, like full on what they say is sleep paralysis. But I am a billion percent confident there was a demon in the room, like not even like, oh, I just had sleep paralysis and I just like was a nightmare. Like, no, like it was full blown. I saw a demon standing at the foot of my bed and I felt two man's like a man, his two arms pressing into my chest, like holding, pinning me to the bed. And I couldn't scream. My eyes were open. I couldn't scream. I just saw this demon creature at the foot of the bed, standing there watching me sleep. And I felt someone, but I couldn't see them pressing me into the bed. So I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. And I just cried. Like there were tears just streaming down my face. Um, but I couldn't make any sounds. And it was the scare. It was one of the scariest things I've ever been through in my life. And, uh, it was awful. And when I closed my eyes, I saw blood. And when I opened my eyes, I saw the demon at the foot of the bed. So I had to make a choice. Like, do I want to see blood everywhere? Or do I want to see a demon sitting at the, standing at the foot of my bed? It was so freaking terrifying. And I was in like a cabin, like I was on vacation and there were so many things that were happening. Like the second we got to the cabin, it just felt like something was wrong. It felt eerie. It felt off. And then like the fireplace like exploded and not exploded, but like when we turned on the fireplace, like all this huge ball of flames like came out of the fireplace and like almost burnt us. And like, um, it was very scary and oh my goodness, not scary is, <gasps> is that Flynn? Is Flynn coming in the room? I think the door just opened. It's Flynn. Hi, baby Flynn. All right, Flynn woke up from his nap. So that's my cue to go. I love you guys. Thanks for watching and listening. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, leave a little review, all the fun things. We love you. Don't forget to relax. Sorry, this episode was so freaking weird. You're the best. Goodbye. You can relax. Colleen and Eric have a podcast. The world is scary and we're locked in our home. But now we have big microphones. So you can relax, that's the name of our podcast.